I want to go through what I'm working on this week, some of the active fleeces and the wool that I'm processing. And the first thing I wanted to show you is the stuff that's been washed and is on the carding table. Um, so what I'm working on right now actively is a fleece from a fawn cat mug at you who is actually not on the farm any longer. We, we um, adopted her out to a, a farm where she's actually going to be enjoying retirement. They're not going to be breeding her or anything, so she's just going to get fat and happy, which is awesome. So I opted to process this shoe this year just because her shearing quality was inconsistent. And there are some portions of the fleece that have really great length and are what I would consider to be acceptable quality to sell to somebody to spin. Frustrating, I'm trying to get it to focus there. So you can see it's just got a beautiful crimp, really nice staple length. And Dowager had, she was a lighter fawn cat mugget. And so there was a, quite a large portion of her fleece that actually, I'm just flicking it out here, that actually looks white. So I sorted out quite a bit of that wool and spun up a skein. I've got somebody that's asking me for you. For a white and I burned through all my white wool so this is gonna be a good substitute it's a pretty creamy white so that's the flicked flicked lock <clears throat> I don't know three four inches maybe so obviously Dowager Countess she was in the Downton Abbey group and so 2016 I can never I do it because I look at my paperwork and then I can remember, but off the top of my head, I'm miserable with that. And then she's got slightly darker bits. This is a, more of a fawn. Darker. But then she just got some pieces that were fairly short, so here's an example of that. And this might have been wool that was on her back. And these I'm spinning myself. I'm not going to torment some poor spinner with these very, very short locks. So I'm gonna, I'm again flicking it. I'll be able to spin this into some really pretty two ply yarns. And depending on what I get, if I get enough of the darker stuff to make a worthy, long enough skein, I'll make a brown skein, but then I might also do a gradient. look the same now that I put them up there but this is this one's a little bit longer okay so that's Dowager Countess so she's active and I've got about two ounces actually carded that I'll spin into bats and I might start loading that up onto the shop and then I've got another fleece I'm working on which is from a you who has also moved on which is kind of weird and this is Curie. So this is actually a fleece from 2019. I was talking to somebody quite recently about processing older stuff. So this is an older fleece. We always sort of thought that her wool was short, but now that we've learned about the timing of ruing and when we shear, it's very, very possible that her fleece is perfectly fine and that it was our fault that she was sort of short. So. Her locks are short, and so I'm going to flick it and spin it myself. So that's what it looks like pre-flicking. Post. It's really pretty. It's really soft. It's going to be gorgeous. So that's something else I'm working on, and I keep it. I keep my wash locks in these really cool, enormous baskets that we bought. When we used to go to 
the Wisconsin Fiber Festival. We used to have our hotel was by this really fun store called Shopco. It's kind of like a Target, but it was like really old fashioned. <laughs> And they would have just some really, we would just like go shopping at night, just like maybe we needed extension cords or something. And we found these bags. There's three of them and they nest and they got little handles. So I put my wash wool in there. I always expect a snake to come out, like snake charm or something. Oh yeah, so this is the Flix stuff I've done with Dowager. She was a great you. We decided to sell her because she had an issue one year and contracted mastitis and it was serious enough that she actually lost an udder. So we didn't want to breed her and we wanted to make sure we didn't sell her to a breeder where she, or anywhere that had rams where she might accidentally get bred. So the place she, we found is perfect for her. Um, but I remember, because every time we have a, some, a sick animal, the vet's always like, I don't know, and Rich is just like, he is determined that he's never going to lose a sheep on his watch, right? So I remember walking in the barn after I came home from work. This was back when I was working full time. And it was dark. And he was standing in the corner with her, nursing her. And he was holding a two liter bottle of saline or something. With a line into her IV standing there as it was drip, drip, drip. It was like an hour. <laughs> and afterwards we're like, we probably could have hung it up on the thing. But he was just like so intent on saving her and he did and she did fine except for the fact that you know she wasn't able to breed anymore and it's too bad that she couldn't breed because she threw some really nice lambs she actually is the you or the the dam of Bruce Wayne who's one of the rams we're going to be using this year and then staying with my theme of working on fleeces of ewes that aren't on the farm anymore this is Caitlin another fawn cat mugget She's got a lot more dark bits. Her fleece is so dense and so squishy. And I don't know, I think maybe we moved her on simply because we just had a lot of fawn cat nuggets. And um, so yeah, I mean, it's nice. This is a, she's, it's really nice. It sort of feels a little bit different I think that might have been, I don't know, it feels a little different from what we typically are breeding for. Just the handle, it's not, it's still very, very soft. So that's a nice lock, so I'm gonna flick this so you can see what it looks like. A minimal tip on this one too. And I'm using my Magicraft flicker. I've got an older style. Now the new ones come with a black handle. So, yeah, this is just terrific. So, yeah, so with her, once I, I seem to have a hard time getting on the carding table right now with all the stuff going on outside. But, um, I'll start carding her and putting her one ounce bats up in the shop. It's really nice. So that's Caitlin. So those are the that's what's going on on my carding table. Now I want to show you a couple other spots in the wool cave, and then I'm going to take you out to the garage, and we're going to look at the next raw fleece that I want to wash. Okay, so over in this corner, I have three things that I'd like to show you um, that are being worked on right now. The camera's a little bit crooked. The worst equipment in the world for making a vlog or whatever. So the first thing I'm going to show you are some yarns I just finished. So these are washed and the next step for these is I want to get them counted out so I know what the yardage is. So this is a skein from Dowager Countess, the fleece that I was showing you on the carding table. So this is uh, something that somebody asked for specifically. They wanted some white yarn. I don't remember what it's going to be going into, but um, the woman that's buying this, she's a really talented knitter, and normally she'll get a pattern and kind of transform it into something that she, you know, with her own ideas and stuff. So really nice bounce you get with that crimp from Dowager. So that's that. 
done. And then the second skein I want to show you is from our Eugenoa. So she's the Great Cat Mugget. She's darker. And we did a piece last week on one of her ram lambs. And so this is kind of a variegated, taking the dark and light bits of Genoa and just kind of smashing them together in a pretty gray yarn. It's so soft. And it's amazing because Genoa's old. I mean, Genoa's like eight or something. And this is just, you wouldn't know it. You would not know. Normally an older you, their wool gets just ever so slightly coarser. Well, good for her. And this is Sansa. So this is a... She was from the Game of Thrones year. Obviously she's black. She's a solid black. And she's really black. I mean, look at that. It's like blue black. And um, she, she really sheared quite badly this year, which is a shame because I've sold her fleece before. Nice, long staple lines. Beautiful crimp. So this time the staple, I mean the wool blocks were really short. So I spun that rather than selling it as a raw fleece. And I only got this out of it. There was a lot of waste that I'm actually going to be putting in the pool of wool that goes into the bats, quilting bats. And so that'll be next year's mill shipment. So those are the, the yarns that I finished this week. The, um, I have not had anything on the needles in so long. I hope I remember how to knit. <laughs> but I did um, wind up that the long draw attempt. So this is the cake of that. And I'm going to be knitting that into a really simple hat pattern that I actually just made up. And uh, size 6 needles, just stocking at, or no, I told you I forgot how to knit. Uh, rib stitch, knit one. Pearl one, 90 stitches, and I do that for, I'll probably do it for five inches, because I think I'll have enough for a brim. And then I knit four inches of stockinette, and then I start decreases every third row, take it off, and it's a nice, handy little barn hat, I call it, so it's real simple. And I'm going to cast on with two needles in the arm, because I tried doing that cast on that was more elastic and I still felt like it was like digging into my head. So now when I'm going to cast on, I'm going to cast on with two needles so that I have a nice loose edge. And if it, you know, if for the brim, then it won't be so tight and stuff. And I know there's probably a really <laughs> smart, easy way to achieve what I'm trying to accomplish by using two needles, but that's just the way I do it. So that'll be on my needles by next the next episode i'll have some progress there and we can see what this is going to look like knit up which is pretty awesome very exciting actually i have my scale here get it level i can tell you how much weight i got from that so this is oh yeah that's going to be plenty i'll definitely have a five inch ribbing so that's 3.1 ounces of wool all right, the other thing I want to show you is um, I'm going to be putting this on the wheel next. So I wrote a blog post a while ago about how I hate throwing things away and things going to waste. And one of the things I featured in there was we, when the COVID first started, the lockdown first started, you know, we did a lot of stocking up on stuff and whenever possible would, you know, use delivery or curbside pickup or whatever. But since we live way far out in the country, we started ordering our wine from a wine store that's in the city and it was being, it was being shipped to us. And before I realized it, they were shipping it to us with two of these, one for the, the bottle and then one for the lid, and it was in this massive box and there was a ton of these, and I was appalled when I unpacked it, but then I thought, well, what would they have shipped it in? Stupid. But anyway, so I stopped doing that once I saw how they were packaging it, and then I'm now, you know, the owner of these, I'm not throwing them out. They will not go in landfill, so I'm going to, one of the things I'm using them for is, um, for my self-striping yarns. So what I had done in the 
past was I would like measure them out and I had them in paper bags and it was kind of a mess and I would always forget what my weights were supposed to be and stuff. So what I've done is I have numbered the cavities. So there's six cavities. I only do five stripes when I do the self-striping yarn. So I've got them numbered one, two, three, four, five. And in each one of the cavities I have a certain amount. I think it's 0.55. See, I wrote it on here so I would remember, remember how much wool I needed to make a specific thing and I'll show you what that is. So I wrote on here 0.55 for each color. So for each of these colors, which is I've got a fawn, I've got a dark gray, I've got a light gray, a white, and the moret, it's 0.55 ounces. And then the other note I made to myself on here is for each stripe, make sure that I weigh out on my scale, which I have my scale here, weigh out 0.11 ounces. And these are really weird measurements, but that's just what it came out to be. And so what I do is I'm knitting, or spinning, excuse me, is I'll just pull out, weigh it, and make sure I've only got the amount that I need for that stripe. And then what I end up with is a three-ply yarn, because I chain-ply them, and I'll show you how I do that at some point here. Um, 158 yards is the specific one, 2.7 ounces. My goal, what I'm trying to get, is a three-ounce skein of self-striping yarn. So these are five different colors and then because the, I don't know the, these are usually like when I finish carding for bats and I have an odd weight that I don't want to make into a bat I'll throw it in one of my plastic bins of the one of the colors so I don't really know who the donor is for these colors so I just have a picture of a group shot of my beautiful girls so it's really fun it's really pretty jazzy so anyways one three ounce skein is enough to make these it's just absolutely joyous pioneer gloves they feel so good pioneer gloves it's a ravelry pattern and they're really fun to make and so right so one skein of that makes the the shorter length there's a there's a longer And I am very embarrassed to confess that there was a point in time where I was measuring my colors wrong. And so there were a few women that bought the skeins from me. And one of them, thank goodness, told me so that I was able to adjust it. But the stripes were more like bands. And I have to imagine she was disappointed because it, this is what they were supposed to look like. Um, so we... If you are somebody that purchased one of those ones that came out wrong, please get in touch with me because I, I don't know where you are. And uh, if you're disappointed, I have to know so that we can make it right. So that's the, the self-striping yarn. And I'll start working on that now that I've got them measured out. I also wanted to tell you that I have my new... Um, flyer installed so I'm going to change the angle of the ca camera and show you that. I wanted to show you my new flyer that I just uh, brought, bought. It came in my last Magicraft order and um, if you're not regularly watching I'm going to tell you that I have been spinning on my Magicraft rows for about 20 years and up until I would say maybe six months ago I had been using the Delta flyer um, for no real reason other than I, that's just what I put it, put, put on it when I first to put it together. So as I'm learning more about the Magicraft products, becoming a dealer for them, um, I got a little bit curious about this particular flyer. I think they call it the fine flyer. I don't remember exactly. The reason I wanted to get this new flyer is, is that every guide that the yarn travels through as I'm spinning is lined with a ceramic ring. Now that particular flyer hook is called the E-flyer hook. And those you can purchase separately if you wanted to just take your Delta flyer and use that instead. And the reason I needed to do this is because I, I was wearing, I wore these out. 
I've gone through three of them. The, uh, the hook on the flyer actually is in good shape, um, but the orifice, I actually went then to the standard flyer that I got with the wheel 20 years ago and they've made a lot of changes and it ended up wearing a, like a quarter inch groove in this, this metal piece here. So it was making it difficult. The yarns kept on breaking as I was spinning them. So I purchased this for my new standard orifice to use. Now, one of the things, I don't know if everybody does this, but when you're putting your flyer on your Magic Craft wheel, all you need to do is get your threads lined up correctly and then just treadle and the flyer goes right on. And then I grab my whorl and I just tighten it, the flyer. So the only adjustment I've had to make going to this new flyer is that I need to thread every guide with a hook, which is new for me because with my old one, I just would wind it around the little spring. I don't think I have it here. So the old one, this is the old design. Everything was open, so I could just kind of wind it without having to use any kind of tools or implements until I came to the actual orifice. With this new one, every single guide is closed, so they, you need a tool to get the single through it. is actually a groove I wore in there. This flyer hook was is fairly new, so that's not worn at all. But even like the little guide here has got a groove worn on it. So, so what I what I'm using for getting my strands through. I know that when I first bought my wheel, there was a little hook to use, orifice tool or whatever it's called. But what I've opted to do is I found in this collection of crochet. Crochet, crochet hooks that I got from my mother when she passed away. Actually, I think I might have stolen it from her before that. But she, you know, she would go to garage sales and auctions and stuff and would always find all this old everything. And she was a knitter and a crocheter. Um, so she would find all these tools and stuff and then organize it. So she'd have all sorts of little things. So I love it. She had this little glass jar might have been a spice jar back in the day. So she's got two crochet hooks in the kit that to me looks sort of bake lighty or ivory or something. I'm not really sure. This is the one that I'm using. But then this is nothing special. It's just a metal big one. I use this when I'm making, doing like have to sew so I don't have to thread a needle. can't read it, but a nice stainless steel, fairly simple one. I'm not even sure what this is. I think this is actually part of a manicure kit. This one is really pretty and very fancy, so it's a really fine hook. I can get that. <laughs> I can't. But it's got a really decorative handle and then like a finial knob at the end. So that one's really cool. I do know how to crochet. I just with all the time I have in my life, I'm choosing to do other stuff. Two standard like, stainless steel ones. And then this is kind of cute. This one's got like a little cap because it's so sharp. It's got like a little lid for it. So that was my mother's crochet hook collection. Just wanted to share that. Okay, back to this. So what I end up having to do each and every time I thread a wheel. And it's so worth it, because this is so much better. Because I just have to thread each, each little guide gets threaded. And then I'm ready to go. The other thing I did, I've noticed, is that the, the spring on the hooks is pretty strong. So it's, it's it takes a little to, to move it. And then of course they've got this I think it's fiberglass material now that they're using for the rods. So I did want to show you that new bit of progress for me. Okay, what's going on over here? So this is my table. This was where I did my interview with Rich, but look what I'm doing. I had done this a lot quite a while ago. These just fetching little 
felted wool lambs. So I'm getting back into this, and then this is just all the kit and caboodle that's part of it. This is hand spun yarn that I use. I put like a little bow at her chin, and then I take a bell. Oh, it's just so cute. So you'll see these when I'm done with them. But I put the bell there. I have to do her face still. It's always scary doing the face because they can come out looking really horrifying. I tried to like mold it so that it looked more like a nose. Kind of loosely basing this on Mrs. Hughes. It's, this is Mrs. Hughes's wool. And what I, the reason I ended up doing this is because there'll be times when I'm carding and I get wool that's, um, it's hard to do with one hand. It's just like really tightly coiled at the tip and pretty short. So it's not really worth the effort to flick it out to spin it. So what I started doing was saving these and I was selling them in bags for like one one ounce bags for crafters and stuff. But I'm com not confident doing that online with uh, people not being able to open the bag up and see it because they're different colors and stuff. But then I, so I use these curly bits for her fleece. So I'm going to do a piece on this, a segment, a whole segment on how I do this. And um, maybe make up some kits so people can do it themselves. But you can see all my wool balls that I've got. And here's a little bit more of a... Uh... Oh dear, that's going to go crashing down. More Mrs. Hughes. But I got bins and bins of this really tightly coiled stuff. What's in here? I gotta get this a little bit more organized. Heads and eyes, or I mean ears. These I could use for ears. I actually needled these. I was trying to get them pointy and perky based on Rich's uh, clinic he did last week for us on confirmation that the ears need to be kind of perky and perched up a little higher over the eyes. Anyway, so that's what I'm working on over here. It gives my hands a break from all the carding and spinning, so it's good. And then I also I'll put a little top knot on her head, so she's got like a little bit of wool up there. You'll see it when it's done. But this is I'm kind of in progress right now. All right, so here's my raw fleece situation. I've got two very large bags of neck wool, moret and fawn, which those are supposed to be processed. I got uh, some neck wool from some rude sheep. No idea what this is. That might be gray neck wool. Down here, I've got some full fleeces. And this one here, Nita's, is the one I was thinking about doing next. And the reason I was thinking about doing her next is I spun her last year and I just loved it. So for whatever reason, which I don't remember, we decided not to sell this one as a raw fleece. So I'm going to open this one up. We're going to take a look at it and jog my memory. And here's three shelves of additional wool that for whatever reason, you know, was deemed not worthy to sell the spinners that's either going to be processed by me or next year now that I've got a new mill I'm using, I might sort this into some of the lots for the pooled lots for some either comb top or yarn or whatever. But yeah, I still have a lot of, a lot of wool. To manage and it's what September and we shear in April so I gotta get cracking all right so this is Nita's fleece and Nita is the NPR year which was 2018 why did I to process and not sell this fleece. So Nita is a fun cat mugget. It is like 4.30 in the afternoon. And I'm not sure why we get so much traffic, but there you go. Well, I'm really excited. This is going to be fun to process but still not sure 
about the logic to do this myself, but that's okay. So this is, uh, anytime there's these big long swags of wool, I know that's the neck because I think I've told you before, the shear goes up the neck and then that whole thing just kind of gets pushed over to the side. When we do shearing day, I'll video a couple of them. You can see that. Pretty, pretty cool. But anyway, so that's the neck and it's really nice. It's nice and dark. It's going to be a pretty contrast to the... creamier, lighter stuff. Pretty color. Bam. So, okay, I didn't skirt off the neck wool. So that must have been, I decided while I was skirting it that I was going to process it. So that's why the neck wool is still on her. Which is good because that means I'm going to get more yardage if I am not going to spin this though it looks like this is going to turn into bats because this is definitely a, a nice length for a spinner pretty crimp it's so pretty so my guess is that she might have been sheared after she hit the rise and so sure enough yeah lots of lots of second cuts and bits and bobs yeah like kind of like this, you can see that that's all second cut that just came off. So yeah, that's definitely not going to be fun. If you're a uh, person that bought a fleece and you're throwing out stuff that you paid for, which I imagine would be incredibly irritating. All right, so, so that's that. And I think what I'm going to do, oh, another big pile of second cuts coming off here right on there. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is try using the combs on this because the length is good and um, and I think what I'll do is I'll comb the entire fleece and then sort it by color and then I can't decide if I'm going to take the combed pieces and put them through the drum carter and make bats or just sell comb top strips put it to a vote. What do you guys think? Again, another matted part that's just going to require. And there's um, some scurf on here as well. But I'm going to change the camera angle and sort of just give you a pan of it so you can see it better and just see how pretty it is. But yeah, I'll be watching this over the next week. And then very soon this will be on my skirting, or my Carding table. All the distractions here. Oh, it's nice. Okay. Just a nice tour of her. Maybe a shorter bit there. fly sitting right on the lens of my glasses, country living. There you can see the second cut, the little blam of it. Wouldn't you be ticked off if you bought this and got had to throw all that out? <laughs> so that's why this stayed with me. It's just not worthy. So what I'll do in the spring with her is check and see if she maybe wants to be rude instead of sheared. It's a gorgeous fleece and she's, we're definitely going to be breeding her this year. She hasn't been bred yet because we weren't breeding as much of the brown base, but this year I am really excited about this one. Can you see it? And it's just so nice and clean, thanks to the coats. All right. Stay tuned.
let's talk about the history of Shetland sheep in North America. So what we're going to talk about is how they got here and then secondly how we managed with other breeders to get them to be fine fleece Shetlands. So in December of 1980, which is 40 years ago, um, Colonel Daly, who was out of Canada, brought a small flock of uh, Shetland sheep to his farm thinking that he'd be able to preserve the breed and we'll talk about what that means in a second. And what we learned last night, we watched the video of the annual general meeting of the Shetland Sheep Breeders in 2005, where Carol Daly, his daughter-in-law, said there were 28 ewes that came from a farm on Shetland Isles, and that the four rams that they brought over were from the UK. Then in 1986, Tut and Linda Doan, they're out of Vermont, they brought a small flock into the US from Canada, and they brought 21 rams and 42 ewes. And this was because five years had passed, so there was a lot of offspring from that original import. So we're told that the original sheep that came over to the dailies were phenotypes who were very close to what the Shetland sheep were supposed to look like, close to the standard as possible. But there was an expectation that traits were going to come out of that that weren't true Shetland traits. And they were aware of that and they were planning on what the plan for what they were going to do to address that. So. I wanted to just kind of talk about, you know, what what was actually happening on the Shetland Islands that was causing the breed to be at risk. Yeah, so I mean, the history that I've looked at, the research that I've done, indicates that there was a lot of crossbreeding going on because there wasn't a very good livelihood anymore for the Shetland crofters. So they were trying to get more carcass weight. They were trying to get bigger fleeces something that could get more money at the at the market. So they were spending a lot of time trying to trying to breed other characteristics into when they weren't really focusing on the pure nature of the Shetlands. Um, and I also believe there was um, a movement to, uh, it was, since it wasn't as profitable, they were moving to the North Sea oil rigs. So they were doing more of that kind of thing because the pay was a lot better. So there were jobs elsewhere and it really wasn't profitable to do sheep anymore as a, as, you know, for your number one uh, earnings. Okay, so my next question is how, what did we do as fine fleece breeders? So, you know, you and me, as well as a few other people that are breeding for the finer fleece, what did we do from that original import to get to where we are today? What were some of the things that took place? Yeah, you mentioned earlier the phenotypes uh, versus the genotypes, right? So the sheep that came over presumably were all correct Shetlands, pheno phenotypically speaking. But we knew, also knew because of the years of crossbreeding that had gone on before then that there was going to be some traits that would come out that were negative. And over many, many years of those negative traits coming out and then people breeding those sheep together because they didn't know any better, you've got some, uh, well, you wanted, what we ended up with were some very coarse Shetlands, uh, crimpless in some cases, very long fleeces that aren't very Shetlandy. Uh, if you really calibrate yourself against the standard in what they're doing over in the UK. So back when we started in 2001, it was very difficult to find anything fine. People that had them in the US didn't, they, you know, they coveted them. They didn't want to sell them. They kept them, they bred with them. So there were a few people that were breeding fine fleet Shetlands at that time, and they, were, they held them pretty close to the best. Uh, once we got some good stock, and a couple of good rams, then we were able to make some progress. And we started to get fleeces that were much finer, denser, a uh, little bit shorter, not six to eight inches, but more in a three to four inch range. And once we started getting that, we said, well, look, a lot of different crimp and softer. Um, and, and our customers started noticing that. But it took a long time because there just wasn't any good breeding stock to start with. Uh, because if you don't have it, you're not going to get it. It's, it you know, you're not going to take two coarse sheep, breed them, and then end up with something fine by luck, you know, by pure chance. Uh, it just doesn't happen that way. So there was a big struggle at the beginning. But the other thing we had to look at is, these, is this what Shetland should look like? Should they be this fine? And when uh, Alan Hill and Kate Sharp, their Shetland Sheep Society judges and inspectors, they came out and they inspected a lot of sheep in Wisconsin in, um, what was that, 2011? I can't remember the year. But, but they came out and they, that was the first time we had brought UK inspectors and judges to the, to the US to look at our sheep. And once we saw that and they kind of validated that, yes, these are the, 
this is what the top flocks in the UK would look like, then we knew we were on the right track, that we weren't going too far, breeding a, you know, really a different breed altogether, uh, which is what you always have to be concerned about with any breed of any animal. So why can't we just bring over more sheep now, right? I mean, if there's fine fleece Shetlands in the UK that meet the standard, why can't we just bring them over here and use them? Yeah, the borders are closed. I mean, we can't bring anything in from Canada either. So, you know, it's a, it's a health thing. It's a USDA uh, governed process and you're just not allowed to do it. So we, you know, it's just nothing, you know, as a US breeder that we can do about that. It's just not an option. Okay, other than the option of artificial insemination, and there are there are some some straws of semen that were brought over that I mean I don't know if those were all fine flea shetlands. I guess the question is what was the impact of the artificial insemination work that people did here in the states to bring in more genetics? Well, I think on fine fleeces. I right. think that was a a big turning point for the Shetland breed in the U.S. because that was the real first injection of new blood into uh, into the breed. Because as I said, people have been breeding kind of the negative traits for many years and they were not very fine. The sheep themselves were not. They were very long coated, double coated. They lacked crimp. And it wasn't until people started doing the artificial insemination with some of the UK rams, like Willowcroft Jamie, Todd Hill Jericho, Heights Orion, uh, to, to name a few. Mm -hmm. they, they all had the traits that we didn't have in the US. So without that, I don't think we would have fine fleece Shetland today. So it's kind of a big thing that had a big It impact. is a big deal, because I don't think, like I said, I don't think we would have fine fleece Shetlands if we hadn't done that. And I shouldn't say we, I mean, it's not like I went out and secured the semen and, you know, yeah. but we did, we did do some AI ourselves, uh, certainly not as much as some people did. But we were able to purchase sheep that had, you know, UK genetics in the background where artificial insemination had been done in, you know, a generation right. or two ago. And then you start really started to see a big difference in the quality, not only the fleeces, but the the, the bodies, the confirmations, a much, much different situation. Okay, so I think now what I want to talk about, so we tried our best to get fine wool from the original import genetics, and then brought in some um, additional genetics from the UK rams. So then there was the... Um, Fine Fleece Shetland Sheep Association that was formed. So this large group of people kind of banded together and you know had similar flock objectives. So can you talk a little bit about you know what was the actual inspiration for forming the Fine Fleece Shetland Sheep Association? Yeah, so most of the members of the Fine Fleece Association, the founding members, originally were NASA board members, including myself, and. You know, we had a little bit of a dis disagreement in terms of what the breed should be doing. So when we started studying genetics and studying the UK breeds, we discovered from talking with Shetland Sheep Society inspectors and judges, this is what the breed should look like. You know, we thought it'd be good if people, other breeders in the US got educated on, look, this is what it's supposed to look like. And that certainly doesn't mean that they have to breed for that style of Shetland, but uh, it was important to find fleece founders that we didn't lose that either. Um, Shetland sheep have been endangered for at different points of their lives because of the crossbreeding and, and the purebred traits were being bred out. And I feel, and a lot of people felt, at least the founding members of the Fine Fleece Association, felt that we were beginning to lose the, the fine fleece traits and it's what truly is a Shetland. So if we go back to the homeland and look at, look at what they're doing and what their sheep are like, are ours like that? And the answer was no in most cases, you know, probably 95% of the cases in the U.S. And we wanted to band together and not so much form a different organization to compete with NASA. It was never about that. But it was about, well, how can we educate people, continue to pay for the U.K. judges to come over? And they've been doing that every year uh, in Wisconsin. So everybody and that's in Fine Fleece is in NASA, right? I mean, it's like a subset of the NASA group, right? Uh, well, it's not affiliated at all with NASA, but yeah, I would say most, if not all members, are also NASA breeders, on NASA members. Yeah. So again, we never looked at, and we, in, in our flock, we never considered, you know, not registering our sheep with NASA, um, because I just don't see, I, I think it's apples and oranges to me, the two organizations. I don't see that they compete with each other. So, you know, the Fine Fleece Association was always about education. And, you know, we register sheep with the association only because 
you know, we want to raise money, so we continue to bring experts over to help educate people and us on what what you know what the breach should look like, whether we're on track or not. And I think that's important in any field that you're in. That you're always constantly calibrating against what's correct. Okay, awesome. So the last question I have is: the Pine Fleece Shetland Sheep Association has trademarked a phrase called traditional 1927, and I think that harkens back to some history in the UK, which we weren't really going to get into too much. But can you talk a little bit? What does that mean? Why? What does traditional 1927 actually? refer to? Yeah, 1927 is, is when the uh, Shetland breed standard was written in England and they, they created that because they, they were so concerned about losing the purebred Shetland that if you read the standard it's all about you know what's correct, the traits, the ears, the fleece, the legs, the nose, what the shape of the head, all those things are they, they noticed immediately that they were taking on uh, Scottish blackface or Cheviot characteristics um, and that's why the standard's written the way it is, because you want to easily um, differentiate, you know, what's a true Shetland trait and what's a something part, partially something else. And they were concerned enough about it that they thought they needed to write a standard. So when we say traditional 1927, that's just saying, yeah, if you're buying a sheep or a fleece product with that label, that trademark then you know it's a breeder that's is con, um, committed to breeding the true type of Shetlands that they would have in the UK, which is what they always were, the finest of the British breed, uh, breeds. All right, good. Well, I think that covers a lot of information and um, gives you a little bit more of a background. It really is just kind of scratching the surface with all the information you could possibly get into with the history of the Shetland breed and stuff. And we'll get into some of that stuff later on, but I really wanted to introduce you guys to the... <laughs> Sorry about the plane, about the history here in North America and the origins. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So it's Friday night, and Rich and Andrew and I just finished putting up 200 bales of hay in this barn here. There's more hay coming tomorrow, so we'll see if we can put any more in this barn. It's pretty packed. I'll show you here in a second. And then we'll be using the old rickety hay elevator. So I'm not sure if you can see, but the hay is stacked right up to the rafters. There's still air space between the hay and the roof. But that's a lot of hay. And then the loose hay that falls down while you're moving the hay around, break that up and that's what I'll be using to feed the, the rams and the quarantine use for the next day or so. So that feels pretty good. And again, there's another 200 bales coming tomorrow. So that's us ready for tomorrow. You can see the hay elevator. We got that at an Amish auction years ago, 10 years ago or so. So we'll be loading up the loft and then this section of the barn here. That's, those are two lambing pens and we'll pack those full of hay and then on the floor here, we got the pallets, and we'll put the pallets down. They managed to dig this little weird pole, I don't know why. So they get all excited and they eat the hay through that fence, but for the most part, it's a good storage area for the hay. So I think this is the last load. I think we're done with hay this year. If each of these loads is around 200, and we've done four wagon loads, so up to 800 bales we've got. I know that Rich is, feels very comfortable that we're not going to run out, even if we have a lot of dry spell and can't use pasture. So that's good. It's a good feeling. Are you guys ready to come in already? I was going to come out and hang out with you. All right, come on. It's like 6.30.
Take your time. I don't normally stand here. Once they get closer, I'll move. That was a Canada goose. We are in the path, the migration path, and they're starting. So, so she's in the lead. Good for you. And so fat, full of hay, or grass, I mean. Did Tess can make it in? Oh yeah, there she is, okay. Is that everybody? I guess we do. Look at how weird that is over there. What do you think about that? It's different. Let's see if you can figure out a way to ruin it or hurt yourselves or something. Think you can? Sorry, it was sarcastic. <laughs> Wasn't very nice, was it? You still got food in your mouth. <laughs> How was today? Did you get enough to eat? How about you, princess? Did you get enough did you get enough grass? that baby. Can you? What are you working on there? Thank you. 